Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Kamala Madali. Um, I am the chair, panel chair, and the moderator for the current panel. Are you able to all see my screen? Can any of the panelists just wave the hand? Okay, great. So um, today we are at the most historic times, you know, in the modern century, the 21st century. So really, um, it's a shout out to everyone on this uh, summit today to take time and to convey about the powerful tools of hope that are coming from the various arenas of science and innovation. As you see, today's panel is going to focus on COVID-19 diagnostics, 360 degree view of novel advancements in testing. And before we proceed and I introduce in a couple of minutes to the various worldwide experts, panelists, I just want to indicate that the discussions on this panel and also on this summit are purely our expert individual perspectives only, and they have nothing to do with our professional organizations that we represent or advise for. And please, please consult your doctor for any medical guidance in relation to anything related to COVID. So every session is for informational purpose, mainly. So I'm moving on to the next slide. I just want to take a moment and let's all pray for one another. The next five seconds. And in this prayer, we're including every one of us, every one of us who have passions who know someone or the other that is battling with COVID. This baby that I have, I had just spoke to the cardiovascular surgeon who did an open heart surgery. The baby is six months old. She was born in October of 2019. She went through a major, major heart, open heart surgery. She was just diagnosed seven days ago or eight days ago. She's based in London, Liverpool, UK, near, near London. And she was just diagnosed. And I spoke to the cardiovascular surgeon, who is a good friend of mine. Baby is doing good. We're talking about really, you know, miracles happening in these times of havoc. So let's not lose hope. And moving forward in this panel, I'll, we bring you world's, worldwide experts who really come with extensive and impressive background from top five industry players like Quest Diagnostics, LabCorp, Roach, Beckman, Coulter, these are the experiences all of these panelists have is impeccable. Let me take a moment and let me request every one of the panelists who are here in this order that I've mentioned on this slide to take, a, to take a moment, 30 to 45 seconds each, if you don't mind, if necessary, one minute, so, you know, to really go ahead and introduce. Please go ahead, starting with Dr. Jamie Platt. Hello, um, my name is Dr. Jamie Platt and I have about 18 years of experience in clinical diagnostics, primarily developing, uh, validating, and then launching diagnostics, um, specifically in the area of infectious disease and then also in oncology. And much of my work has focused in molecular um, testing um, and specifically next generation sequencing. Thank you, Dr. Blatt. And I, I could add, I guess, um, also that I ha do have specific um, development and uh, validation expertise in SARS. Um, back for the 2003 SARS pandemic, was actively involved in um, developing tests for SARS as well as for influenza, including the H1N1 2009 pandemic. Um, which I developed with my team as a sequencing test to help with vaccine efficacy studies. So I'm looking forward to um, talking with the other panelists and exploring um, what can be done in terms of the next type of diagnostics, um, diagnostic tests for you know, helping with uh, therapy and also vaccine development. Dr. Mishra? Can you please introduce yourself? Dr. Mishra, you're muted. Please unmute your mic. Thank you. 
Ah, uh, yes, so sorry about that. Um, my name is Vishnu Mishra, and I come from an extensive IVD background, um, both in infectious disease and in, in cancer. Um, um, one of the reasons that I'm on this panel, I guess, is because of um, the fact that I was part of the team that developed um, the first commercially used diagnostic when swine flu happened. And I can tell you when swine flu happened, the panic level was much, much higher than it is today. Uh, well, it is now, but when we first heard about the pandemic, it wasn't. And the reason was that we were quickly able to contain swine flu. And I think everybody was complacent. And they said, if we can do the swine flu, we can do uh, the COVID-19. But yeah, so I, I, uh, I like to evaluate new platforms, develop technologies, have ex extensive experience of uh, bringing new assays um, to the market. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Pisano, would you like to please introduce? Hi, my name is Dr. Rick Pisano. Um, my training is primarily as a translational physician. Um, simply put, that means I have a PhD and an MD. And my graduate training, my PhD is in molecular virology, uh, which is very appropriate for the current pandemic. My medical training is internal medicine and infectious diseases. Very basic, uh, understanding what a translational uh, individual is, is I try to understand and apply what is in basic sciences and apply it to directly patient care, but also understanding what patients need, either in the pharmaceutical or diagnostic area, and how we have to go back to basic sciences to deliver the appropriate drugs or tests to improve their health. So I have a very strong uh, connection with the CDC, have worked with the FDA, and am a very strong advocate for public health. Thank you, Dr. Pisano. Dr. Bassam, can you please introduce? Yes, uh, happy Saturday, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Bassam from Maui. I'm actually the founder and, uh, and uh, basically the president CTO of Maui DNA Technologies. Um, have over 25 years experience in genomics in general, uh, specifically on sample track. So um, I worked in Beckman Coulter. I was uh, pretty involved in the Ampure uh, PCR cleanup uh, 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 commercialization. Um, Ampure XP is actually uh, was uh, the one I was responsible for, which a lot of people use in their library construction for next generation sequencing. I always had a niche for making things better, uh, improving workflows. And one of the challenges I always saw is sample collection from uh, uh, accessibility as well as um, quality. So uh, I spent quite a bit of my time on that. Um, in 2014, I've decided that enough, uh, let, let's, let's focus and, 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 and fulfill that uh, kind of uh, objective in my life is, is really work towards uh, producing um, sample collection that's easy to, to collect and process. So we are, uh, Maui in general, actually one of our products is pretty involved in COVID sample collection. Um, it's being used all over the globe now. Um, so anyways, this is, this is uh, you know, this is a summary of, of who I am and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be very helpful in, uh, in this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Overall, one thing I really want to compliment about all of the panelists here is they come with extensive experience, you know, during the swine flu, SARS, Zika, SCV, HIV. This is an Ebola. This is an integral group that was involved in the development of these various tests and also the de deployment and also the traceability and the next steps from the public health perspective that Dr. Pisano was alluding to. So let's go to the crux of the panel. And I know most of us, including every one of us, have questions about, okay, what are the different type of tests that are out there? We hear um, molecular tests like PCR, we hear antibody tests. Let us hear to the perspectives of the experts. 
starting with Dr. Pasano, and then I'll also request a few other panelists' names on this topic and get their perspectives. Pasano, your comments. Uh, hi. So it can be very confusing to understand when you request a test from your healthcare provider, what they're testing specifically. What Dr. Kamala said, if you think about a molecular test, what you're trying to do is find out if you have the virus. So it's very, very specific to determine if the virus is present. If you have virus and it's coming out of your nose or your mouth, then you can be infectious to other individuals. This is how it spreads. So understanding if an individual is virus positive is very important. The complementary test that's being developed and actually launched in many locations, a few recently and many more this week, is the antibody test. Um, another term for it is called serology, but really all you need to know is antibody. That test is, is looking at your blood, not your, your, the nose nasal swabs that they're taking for the virus detection. It's looking at your blood and it's determining whether or not you individually have mounted an immune response to the virus. So if they do not find virus, but they find that you have antibodies to the virus, it indicates that you've been exposed to the virus. So it's an indicator of exposure. Others can comment? Thank you, Dr. Pisano. Dr. Mishra, would you like to contribute to this uh, question, please? You're on mute. Yes, what, yes, what I can say is that, um, I, I mean, having been in this business for a very long time, I can say that development of tests that are very specific and sensitive is not an easy, easy task. It can take several months sometimes to get a test that is, uh, is satisfactory enough to be launched. But in case of uh, things like pandemics, you have to do your best and throw in all the resources to developing only one test. And hopefully that will meet your need for now. But I think we should constantly work on making our tests more sensitive and specific um, for the for the wires. And I am sure that there are many tests out there in the field being used that can be improved. Um, there are no off-the-shelf tests available. I understand people's anxiety about not being able to get screened. We are talking about screening millions of people. So, uh, and we don't have that kind of resources to make that, ma that many tests available that quickly. Plus there's this question of centralized testing. And I think at some point we should talk about decentralized testing in case of pandemic, because it's, it's time consuming to transport things and then get it tested in one place. Um, that's my thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Basim, from an innovative perspective, with the current technologies that we have, with PCR and also with the antibody test, what else would you think from the advanced technology perspective would be some game changers from a testing perspective? So from a testing standpoint, to understand uh, the, the virus in general, uh, just from uh, terms of infection and spread. So molecular, molecular testing has to continue. And we need to re resource maybe to next generation sequencing uh, to understand the different subtypes of the virus. Now, um, there's two, two, uh, two areas here. So one is basically we wanna control the spread. And while we're doing that, we wanna understand how the spread is, is happening. So a demological tool has to be involved in this. And I think uh, those has to be done in parallel. Um, so for from any, uh, you know uh, antibody testing still not yet there from a um, I would say from a sensitivity standpoint and specificity standpoint um, this needs a little bit of work uh, on that area um, but as it stands now we have to rely you know in terms of uh, testing uh, if we're gonna do like a, a fast uh, quick test to the masses, we, uh, you know, there isn't, uh, we have to do like literally now uh, find a reliable ser serology test and then follow up with uh, a molecular test. 
Thank you, Dr. Basam. Thank you. Actually, on this very topic, might be uh, Dr. Pisano can answer. We just received a question from the audience that is it possible to still have the COVID-19 virus and at the same time to have antibodies? Um, the answer is yes. And that's very in, a very insightful question. Um, it doesn't happen with everyone. Um, and it's usually in a very limited period of time. There is um, a late antibody that comes up. It's called IgG. You don't have to remember that. It's just a late antibody. Normally, when that comes up, it comes up at a time when the virus starts to disappear in your body. It's an immune response to help uh, eliminate the virus. However, there are times um, in, in its published literature to say that there are individuals who in fact still are virus positive when they have the, the um, antibodies present. It doesn't last forever. It's a limited period of time. Sometimes it's two days after the antibodies appear. Sometimes it's a week. We don't have enough data to make an absolute certain time frame. Um, but that's, that is very, very important uh, for you to know that uh, because if you are shedding virus, then you are potentially infectious and it's something to really be take, take very careful note of and, and continue to use precautions. Thank you, Dr. Pisana. Um, well, in regarding to the different types of tests, Dr. Blatt, would you like to add about um, the different applications of the testing, not only from diagnostics, but also where else this test can be applied? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's an excellent question. And I would like to just um, say that that's important and helps to address one of the other questions that has come up. So um, in addition to a diagnostic, which helps assess if someone does or does not have the disease or has a specific biomarker, we can use biomarkers to also look at things like therapy selection and help with um, understanding if vaccines are efficacious. So um, the, the molecular tests we're talking about now and even the um, antibody tests that Dr. Pisano referred to are the diagnostics typically used here. But at some point in time, we will want to start to think about the other types of tests for SARS-CoV-2 that would help in therapy development as well as vaccine development. And with that, I think the, so I think that sort of helps answer one of the questions that came out mm -hmm. about, you know, um, deciding um, which technology to use. So I think our, you know, we'll have to rely on other technologies and other types of assays and tests as we continue to deal with the pandemic and then continue to work on um, solutions to, um, for therapies and vaccines. Sure. And Dr. Pisano, would you like to add? Please? I just want to add one very quick point um, for the participants in this, is that you will hear us talk about two different terms. The public understands all of this as COVID-19. That is the disease. What Dr. Platt just mentioned, and I want to make sure everyone understood, when she said SARS-CoV-2, that is the virus. So there's a difference between the term of the virus and the disease. And so you'll hear people interchange those. So when you hear some of the panelists, like Dr. Platt, who's a virologist, make a comment about SARS-CoV-2, she's speaking about the virus. It's not something different. I just want to be very clear to the audience. Thank you. We just received another question on this topic. I think antibodies is a very hot topic, as we all discussed while prepping for the panel. If my IgA um, is low, and not being tested, treated, how much great risk am I for complications? Who, who are you asking? <laughs> to the panelists, you know, whoever can chime in, please. Yes. Yeah. So. I, I, I would take that. So I, we, we don't have enough evidence about uh, IgA as being uh, a parameter to be tested. So uh, I see Rick nodding his head. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Dr. Bassam, please. Yes. Yeah. So I, I guess this is this is uh, the bottom line. Uh, a lot of our panelists here, we would speak to the evidence we have currently, 
and uh, we will not uh, extrapolate on anything that is in, in the media or we just talk to the evidence that we have. So if I understand this correctly, we still need to build scientific evidence. We still need to understand the various patient, you know, sort of immune profiles and dynamics and then understand it from a clinical standpoint, what it means, right? Yes, correct. So I would say like anything in science, it is like a jigsaw puzzle. puzzle. Yes. So we are putting the pieces together yes. uh, no. from different aspects. You know, um, when we talk about testing, uh, you know, we look at the, the sample collection, we look at, you know, what is available for us from a biological active material that we can test. We are looking at accessibility of those samples and how fast we can process them. So the other aspect of it, okay, it gets to the lab. So uh, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna run these tests in within a lot of these tests are called for 24 hours. You have to run it, otherwise, you know, it's no good anymore. So. Um, uh, so all these kind of components in, in the process that uh, we're, we're uh, quite a bit working on to get better understanding of it. So this is from a testing standpoint. Now from, there's a lot of research going on in terms of understanding the physiology, the, the you know, the, the biology, the therapeutics aspect of it. And basically this is what we can speak about. Um, I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert in therapeutics, but at least uh, we try to uh, to understand what's there in, in, in literature and, and talk about it. Um, I can comment uh, a little bit on the IgG um, and IgM, but uh, I, I just for the for the audience, um, there are multiple types of IgG. Uh, these are immunoglobulins that are secreted by our immune cells when they see a foreign body in our in enter inside our system, and normally you would get an IgM and IgG response to a virus and IgG, IgA is typically when you have an allergic reaction. So I think we, we in this, this panel will mainly be talking about IgG and IgM. And um, uh, we recently, uh, you know, one of the panel, um, Rick mentioned about antibody testing and the sensitivity. I just read yesterday and this is happening every day. One or the other company is coming out with a new test. And one of a major test producer or equipment producer came out yesterday well, it didn't come out, but the data came out yesterday where a test has been introduced for antibody, which is 100% sensitive and 99.6% specific. Now that is a test that you can't beat. If it stands out that this is indeed correct, then this is, in my opinion, is a game changer. However, it still is not as high throughput as we would like it to be, but can do up to 40,000 samples a day. So. This is something we need right away to start doing an epidemiological survey of our population to understand how many people out there are walking with antibodies and are not getting infected. That would be the time when we can say, we can rely on a test and the antibody levels in people um, to be able to go out uh, with some degree of uh, confidence that they won't get infected again or reinfected. I would caution though, in the periods and time we are in right now, in the stage of pandemic, we will still need good surveillance to make sure that when we do that, that people are followed, tracked and traced and see if there is any symptoms that come up and we should be ready to act immediately. But this will be a great tool for, uh, for bringing people out of lockdown and going back to work. That speaks for the power of uh... Um, tracing the data, tracking, and the analytics. Here comes the, you know, the artificial intelligence component with the bioinformatics component, which is very key. It's not just testing, but also how you track and how you really, you know, understand the dynamics and also come up with particular guidelines based on this information, right? And I hope the next panel or the, one of the upcoming panels uh, might be one, one or two panels from here from the AI perspective, you know, gets to address some of the advancements from an artificial intelligence perspective in this regard. Uh, Rick, would you like to add uh, one no, more I comment in this regard? One, one very quick comment, I think, to, talk, to, to comment on Dr. Misha's um, note on why we need to do epidemiology studies is that is that there can be anywhere from 25 or more percent of the population that get infected that have no symptoms at all. 
And so people are walking around with absolutely no symptoms. And one of the ways you can determine if they've been exposed is looking at their antibody. Uh, because those people in the past were not tested by the molecular test for the virus uh, because they were asymptomatic. But we do know that a significant portion of people have no symptoms at all when they're infected. So does it mean, the question came in this regard, I'm reading the questions that are coming in in parallel is two questions. The first one is, um, so basically people who, who are virus negative and antibody positive can be safe to return to work once the shutdown ends? Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, can, I, can take, I can take a stab at the question. It's a very complex one. I'll try to give you my opinion and others Please. can chime in. So when you ask the question about safety to return to work, it's actually two questions in my mind. Is it safe for you to return to work because you're not infectious to others around you? If you are virus negative, I think that's, that's a reasonable comment. I don't say anything is absolute. Um, I just make the comment that that is generally what the Center for Disease Control has said. If you're virus negative, you are not infectious to others around you. The second part of the question is, are you susceptible now to getting infected? And that's a question we have no answer to specifically yet. Um, there are many things you hear on the television that if you have antibodies, you are immune. We are looking at the data very hard right now. I can't answer you based on science. You know, as, as uh, Dr. Boston said, if we don't have the data right now to absolutely confirm immunity and to what degree an individual would have immunity. So again, there are two questions. When you look at antibodies and you look at virus, you're asking whether or not you are at a risk to others or whether or not you are at a risk of getting infected. That's very helpful. Dr. Pat, would you like to add anything to this question, please? No, I think, um, I think it actually, um, Dr. Pisano did a great job addressing that question. And I, I would like to just maybe tie this in, um, you know, my earlier comment about the types of assays and tests available and epidemiology, because, you know, it's important to understand Yes, the diagnostic is important, but for the epidemiology and for really not only understanding the evolution of the pandemic and the virus, understanding how we best treat the virus. And as we begin to develop vaccines, if those vaccines are um, efficacious or not, that's where the other types of testing comes in. So, you know, I, I guess I'd just like to highlight that there's really needs to be a fairly global approach and it's it's sort of time bound. So, you know, it's important when the epidemic first started before it was a pandemic that we understood, um, you know, things like the R not, how fast it was spreading to um, understand then if it would become a pandemic. And of course, now that we understand it is a pandemic, how do we start to address it more globally and understand how we can um, effectively treat it? And, you know, as the panelists have already alluded to, we don't have enough data yet. We really don't have enough data to know um, when it's safe to go back to work, regardless of uh, a test result. And I would like to just mention, too, that, you know, no test is perfect. It's really about working with your physician to selecting the right type of test mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, coming up with the best course of action, not only for you, but for your loved ones. And then thinking about, you know, what's going to be best to help um, in a societal sense as well. Oh, that's quite um, helpful. Thank you very much. There are a couple more questions actually, very interesting. Um, has anyone looked at the role of T cells, T cells in immunity? And I know one of our keynote closing panelists, uh, Dr. Hariri, is working on this very concept. Um, but any perspectives from the panelists from a testing perspective? The role of T cells in immunity. So uh, the role of T cells is yes. it known in immunity, but do we know uh, what T 
you know, in the COVID context, oh, right? We, again, so uh, we, it's the same aspect of uh, similar answer. We don't have evidence yet. Um, yes. I would like to, you know, there is a huge amount of our uh, amount of effort from our colleagues all over the world, and everybody is running, uh, actually uh, sprinting, not running, to to find answers. And I tip my hat to all of these uh, great scientists and uh, my, of course, my fellow panelists here. Everybody's trying their best to understand the mechanistic of yes. two things. How this virus infects us, uh, actually three things. How actually it's transmitted, like how it spreads from an epidemiological standpoint, how it infects us, and how our body responds to it, and what is, of course, part of the, to, to create prebiotics, to create proper testing. Just want to follow up on one thing um, uh, on the uh, previous question. I wouldn't, if anybody thinking, oh, we're going to go back to work, I'm asymptomatic, and, you know, I'm, I have, I'm virus free. Um, do not, so most probably, uh, we want to be ready to be retested again and again. So even for people that are, you know, basically have got cured. So just a, a word of caution, this is might happen, but um, just to go back to the question, everybody's working very hard. We don't have an answer on the t cells aspect of it, at least as far as I know. Yes, I was actually in regard to this while I was researching and I think, you know, it comes down to understanding the mechanism, right? And it also comes down to the fact of uh, the concept of patient monitoring why some people are responding better, why some people are not, right? So it's it's a question of, okay, let's actually, you know, investigate further and then understand better the role of, you know, cell, cell induced uh, immunity, you know, all of these aspects that we have seen in exactly. CMP and all of those contexts. It's, so, you know, a, daily, it's a daily discussion between among, among ourselves. It's like, why people responding better than others? Yes. So you see athletics people are getting it hit hard. You see like non-athletics are just cru cruising through the infection. And this is very, you know, uh, part of our puzzle that I just mentioned. So I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, in this context, just from a, from a lemon perspective, a six month old, wherein I picked up the phone and I called the cardiovascular surgeon today. She's doing wonderful. And then I saw another news, 106 year old recovered. 104 year old recovered. But then, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 30s, we see all sorts of mixed opinions. So that way, you know, so really, you know, this is something, you know, very intriguing from a scientific standpoint. Yeah, this is, brings a very interesting aspect, which is we need to look at epigenetics as well, not just epigenetics. Absolutely, you nailed it. So you nailed we, it, yes. We need to. This is one of the things. This is you know, what, why your question early on is very critical, what innovation we need to do. There is a lot of innovation. It's just trying to understand the whole process of how this virus does what it does. Yes, that leads to one of the, uh, 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 Dr. Mishra, do you have any uh, sort of comment in this regard on yeah, this topic? Yeah, so Please. I wanted to pick up on what Rick said about, uh, and also what Basam said about um, why some people get sick and others don't. Others don't. First of all, the, the, I know Rick's taken a very, very conservative approach as to when people can go out to work and how the antibody test is not a sure shot, which is correct. I mean, in, in a scientific world, we see data speaks, and if we don't have data, we can't uh, draw conclusions. But I don't want to uh, this audience to leave with the feeling that there's no hope. If you go back and look at what coronaviruses do, that uh, and if you act just based on that, you probably can allow people to go out tomorrow and if they have an antibody titer high enough because coronavirus viruses do have, do produce immunity and high, you know, antibody um, that stays in humans for a long time. Now, having said that, this is a novel virus. We don't know if this is going to do the same thing, but if you go by the principles of vaccination, like we vaccinate people, uh, kids in childhood and the immunity lasts pretty much their lifetime. So if we go by that, that, um, that we will um, more than likely, as we get more data, it'll turn out to be that uh, people who get infected have high enough antibody titer to sustain another infection and not get sick. 
The second question I wanted to make that there's two things we need to keep in mind. One is when somebody is asymptomatic, could that person spread? And a recent study, and this is this is this is like a mo movie unfolding in front of us. This pandemics are novel viruses, and new things are discovered. A report just came out yesterday that while some people show positive, and I think it is out of Korea, some people tested positive after some time, um, even though they had the first infection. The question is, is it the viral DNA, which is not infectious, or is it the virus? They were not able to grow virus from those patients. That's telling us for some reason there is residual RNA from the virus that's causing it to appear as positive. So we have to distinction distinguish between these situations. And I said, as I said, that this is like a movie unfolding. Cool. Um, or I, want, I also want to say that the antibody testing will at some point uh, become necessary. And um, we, we will reach a point where we will start to take a very cautious approach in almost like a, a live experiment uh, in our population to see, can we start having people going, go back to work and keep a cautious approach while watching them constantly. Yep, thank you, thank you, Dr. Mishra. We got another question. How can the engineering community help companies like Mavi accelerate testing kits or other critical tools? Vlad, do you want to contribute to this, please? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I think I can address it in a more um, global sense, first of all. So, obviously, you know, the engineering community can help um, with innovation and, and ideas. But let me just give a little bit of a background that diagnostics is a highly regulated industry, regulated by um, at least eight different entities. So I think in general, um, we as citizens can help with this. And um, how we can do that is by ensuring that we um, you know, vote, ensure that we are aware of you know things um, that the government um, does, and you know lending our voice to democracy to ensure that you know these things innovation can continue and continue in a safe way. So I would say it's really about being a good global and contributing citizen, even you know not just globally but also locally. So being aware of how um, we contribute, how our vote counts, and you know, how a democracy works is, is what I would suggest. And happy for other panelists to comment maybe more specifically, but it is a highly regulated industry. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Bassam, I, I know, so if you could, you know, you know yeah. comment here. That so I, I think the question is more of, uh, I, I, you know, do we need more money to accelerate? <laughs> I think it's more of leaning towards, um, do uh, the public come in and, and invest or something like that? Uh, this is one part of the question. I think this is what uh, the, the person that asked the question is relating to. It's really, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's more about money, it's more about collaboration between different groups. And uh, as actually Dr. Platt has mentioned, uh, as well as the regulatory part of it. So it's more of um, um, getting more collaboration, more transparencies uh, within companies, within the regulatory part. I, again, here also, I want to mention uh, the FDA and uh, CDC. So uh, mostly the FDA has actually been working extremely hard to enable all of us in, in, the, in this industry to, to produce. Basically, they actually cut a lot of red tape um, um, and allowed a lot of companies uh, to get the, you know, they utilized the early, the emergency uh, use authorization extremely well. And I can tell you, um, they work Saturdays and Sundays. Sometimes we take a couple of hours a break, but I can tell you they are working seven days a week. And, you know, it's not like I, I, I want to give them credit for this. So the public needs to understand our federal, federal organization, especially like the FDA and CDC, are really trying their best. Um, Thank you, Dr. Blossom. Um, uh, one last point. Also, uh, what Dr. Mishra said, it is a ton of hope. You know, it's, we're working very hard and actually we're making a lot of progress. So uh, that's, I'm gonna end up with that. No, no, that's a very good comment. Go ahead. 
the, the engineering community can really help because the technology is, it needs to improve and already there are biosensors um, like based technology that is being used to identify which are very, very <laughs> rapid. One other thing we want to do is quick testing. Um, and now there are tests which are which used to take whole day that can be done in 20, 30, 50, 45 minutes. Um, is a cartridge based test. You put in the sample in a cartridge, insert it into the machine, half an hour later you have the result. There is now a test that gives you result in five minutes, but I think we need to deploy th that um, at so many locations throughout the country to be able to effectively use them, which is not the case. And that was my point about decentralized testing. I also want to pick up on, on and it's not a um, topic of discussion today, but there are people working on why some people get sick and why others don't. There is a mm -hmm. big biobank being created by some major institutions around the world. And those samples from these patients who are coming down and those who are not are going to be investigated to understand the genetics, the epigenetics, and all of the factors that play into why, why we see what we see in, in a pandemic. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. We have another three minutes and uh, let me thank you all, every one of the panelists, really, you know, to give your strategic, you know, sort of perspectives and scientific perspectives. Very helpful. We tried our best to answer most of the questions. There are some more questions which we'll get back to you, but also a few questions on cell-mediated immunity and all. Please, please feel free to post those questions in the keynote closing session, um, especially by one of the uh, no, CEOs of Cellularity joining, which will be great, great perspectives that you could hear about the value of diagnostics into the application on development of therapeutics. It would be amazing. And um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, one last note, you know, before we transition, I just want to convey namaste to everyone in our efforts. And let's not forget the light within us honors the light within the opposite person. With that, I just want to take a moment of applause to every panelist who really joined to Grit Health and to every one of the audience who have taken time to really join and hear to our perspective. The next slide you will see is the panel that is coming in, which is Logistic Challenges in the Artificial Intelligent Data Science Approach. Thank you very, very much. Have a wonderful day. Arun, we are waiting for the next panel. Uh, next panel to kick start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin and Horatio. Please, please start the next panel when you're ready. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Arun, and thank you to Grit Health and the American Association for Precision Medicine. This is uh, session number three, focused on supply chain logistics challenges and the artificially intelligent data science approach to fight COVID-19. We have a tremendous panel. And what I wanna share with the audience is that we're going to give a perspective on all aspects of supply chain management, as well as the, the big data, artificial intelligence, and overall analytics, as well as elements of ethics. And, and when we speak about ethics, we think about the entire population. So again, thank you to GRIT and to AAPM as an industry partner, the Bio Supply Management Alliance is a worldwide community of operations and supply chain management leaders and professionals in the life science industries. And I'm very proud to represent BSMA in this event. I'd like to introduce the panel and participants. Suri Bharadwaj has spent the last 30 years helping organizations transform in disciplines such as supply chain, sourcing, and other disciplines leveraging combinations of business processes financials, and technology. Sudi is currently with SAP Ariba. Frank Toussaint is a supply chain expert and managing director of Biolog Consulting, where he has led over 300 global consulting engagements with life sciences and healthcare clients. Frank is also the executive director and co-founder of BSMA Europe. Nell Watson 
is a machine learning researcher and ethicist who has led initiatives in applying machine vision for digital healthcare and is a co-founding member of the International Society of Digital Medicine. You can find Nell at www.nellwatson.com. Dr. Astrid Stuckelberger is a scientist, researcher, and trainer and author in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. She is an international expert for the World Health Organization, United Nations, and European Union. Dr. Payush Mathur is an anesthesiologist and intensive care unit physician at the Cleveland Clinic, who is on the front lines of battling coronavirus. Martin Kupa, who is my co-moderator, operates his own consulting company, Sienko.io, and has worked for a variety of artificial intelligence and robotics companies in his career with a strong academic background in physics and cybernetics. And finally, Ritesh Patel is a digital and social evangelist and currently the digital the Chief Digital Officer for the Health and Wellness Practice at Ogilvy Consulting, focused on innovation and digital transformation in health. I continue to welcome the audience, audience to ask questions via our chat interface. And I'd like to present uh, the current state to the panelists as we begin our, our Q&A session. We have heard and read so much about the supply chain challenges and opportunities with personal protective equipment, diagnostics and testing, and therapies and vaccine. There are obviously immediate, midterm, and long-term goals in support of our frontline healthcare providers, global populations, and sick patients, and above and beyond the supply chain management issues, the big data, artificial intelligence, and ethics questions that come up on how to manage this effectively. I'd like to start off with Frank Toussaint, as COVID-19 is making its way throughout every region of the world, what is the state of the European and Asian supply chains? What are the initial challenges and how are the countries in these regions coming together? Frank? Yes, actually we're seeing different steps, of course, of the, the various countries in terms of, uh, of development of the, the disease. But however, we've been through uh, from uh, supply and sourcing challenges in terms of PPE, medicines and uh, also um, basic supplies for the diagnostics. Now the, the situation is getting better with importation facilities for the air freight industry. Also some resilient solutions starting from every country. There were missing collaboration at the start, especially in Europe, but now it tends to, to increase more and more. Um, and actually also in, a, in China from the start where I followed also some project already in January, there was some resilient solutions being built. Now it's, it's learning, but additionally, there were not enough collaboration from what we've seen initially. It started to, it started to grow so far, uh, but at this point, we're still struggling with finding some basic supplies of medicines, like for example, for uh, some anesthesia product, which is more difficult to, to supply. Um, so it's it's still an everyday uh, solution to be found, but uh, like we've been working on some nice project with also WHO that has set up new hubs around the world. Uh, I've been working on one in in Europe with Liège Airport, which will also help to supply Africa in a next challenge in the coming weeks. So I would say like like we're learning uh, every day, trying to find solution, and definitely supply chain is becoming more and more important in terms of the, the world value chain uh, of, the, of this industry. Yeah, that's the point so far. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. And Dr. Mathur, what has been your experience on the front line, specifically with the Cleveland Clinic? Yeah, so uh, again, the opinions I'm gonna restrict it to, to mine and uh, uh, not represent like certain organizations over here, but I can tell you that uh, what's publicly known, like Cleveland Clinic has been at the forefront of, of this, both from being able to manage the, the supplies very well, uh, both from PPE side, from medication side, and uh, various other uh, equipment that we might need. Uh, I can also tell you, because uh, this is all uh, available in, in public knowledge, that uh, there has been uh, uh, modeling done over here to prepare ourselves for the worst case scenario. Uh, I can also tell you in talking to a lot of my colleagues who are at the forefront of this uh, with myself, 
at many other locations, whether it's New York or New Orleans, there is a significant uh, supply chain issue and a supply chain crunch in all those areas. And there is nothing that we have enough of. Uh, so it, it is a pretty significant uh, issue. I mean, you have to think about this more in context of a, of a wartime scenario. This, this is not your usual scenario. This is a wartime scenario. So you should expect and anticipate uh, difficult times. Great, thank you, Dr. Mathur. I'd like to expand the discussion in regards to some of the activities associated with artificial intelligence, big data, and technology. So for some of the other uh, panel members, what is the number one challenge facing AI, big data, and technology enablers in helping organizations gain insights into current supply chains? And what is being done to manage this challenge? And overall, how can artificial intelligence and big data be used for more predictive modeling of supply chain issues and challenges? I'd like to start with Sudi. Hi, and thanks so much for having me. Now, really the question, if you ignore technology for a moment, you think about the supply chains we've built over the last few years, we've actually spent 20 plus years building brittle supply chains focused on cost, not on risk and assurance of supply. Uh, what we need to do is think about resilient supply chains, those who perform better in times are needed and even better when times are good. And the first question you think about kind of towards a predictive model and forecasting and artificial intelligence and big data is what do you, how do you control what happens 10,000 miles away 100 days from now? You think about that, that actually frames the question. And so we think about compressing all your reaction times. Organizations demand on one end, plan their demand, eventually they plan a supply. That whole process has to be shrunk. People do that on average one month, three weeks. Uh, we need to get that down to days and weeks instead of days and months. And that requires an enormous amount of data, enormous amount of filtering of the data intelligently, as well as learning. What are the demand changes that happen quickly? And then how do I react that and convert that demand into supply signals? What's gonna happen over the next uh, year or two is we're gonna see sudden demand shifts and supply shifts. There'll be shortages, we see that. There'll be increases in demand which cause shortages. Servicing some of those demands today will cause other supply shortages. We need to predict and align our supply chains accordingly. Then we're also gonna be supply chain shocks, which are immediate and fast changes that catch a lot of people by surprise. Leveraging all that data, and that data has to come from social sediment from clinical information, from a variety of sources, which again brings the big data into question, need to be weighed and again intelligently understood so that organizations can predict and then more importantly be more agile when meeting those demands with their supply. Thank you. Thank you, Sudi. And Martin, would you like to uh, add additional commentary in terms of this perspective of big data? artificial intelligence and these technology enablers that we're attempting to use to develop a more resilient supply chain of the future? Thank you, Horatio. Uh, thank you, Sudi, for setting up a good um, opportunity for me to make some points. I want to first level set um, our understanding of the concept of big data, because it's a term which is high terribly at this time. AI, Artificial intelligence might be better understood at this time of its development as augmented. What we're seeking to do with AI and the big data that fuels the output from AI systems is to do four things. Number one, we want to increase productivity. In these days of over-exercise clinicians in the front line, Anything we can do to help their productivity so that they can spend half an hour more, an hour more with their families, it's going to help them not burn out. It's really crucial. It's also about quality. Again, with overworked clinicians, the opportunity for errors creeps into the human 
decision making process. If we can have a support system that helps them build more quality, more accuracy, more precision medicine into these uh, decisions, we'll be better off on the most part. It's about personalization, about understanding individuals in the complexity of their personal circumstances, not being treated like a piece of, uh, um, how can I say, assembly line, digital, for digital health. Treat them as humans and with their particular needs and factors. And then discover the ability to rapidly develop an understanding of the virus and understand and develop new vaccines, new therapeutics, new diagnostics. These are the critical key elements. Now, in terms of the supply chain, what we can do is to apply a concept called digital twin. It's where we build a cybernetic model, digital, of reality. In this case, that is called it the social dynamics of a city. Let's pick Wuhan, for example. In the early days of the epidemic, pre-pandemic circumstances, there were social media interactions, there was missions into hospitals, there was a massive amount of big data. And if we used our AI systems, and people did, but not as well as perhaps they could, we would have been in a better position to catch the epidemic before it became a pandemic. So there are some key issues there. If you'd like, uh, uh, Horatio, I'd like to uh, share a slide um, uh, on this point. Can I do that? Sure, please. Oh. So tell me if you can see my screen, Horatio. Should be coming up. It's a PNG file. It might take a while to look. But it's an interesting analysis and it relates to digital twin. And it's to do with monitoring of uh, social networks in Wuhan at the time of uh, the outbreak in, uh, in January and February. Now, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but I want you to look at the social media from Google, Baidu, Weibo, these are Chinese social networks like Twitter and the crypt network and the, the traffic which is coming up. This is traffic related, something we call natural language processing, catching keywords which are related to uh, epidemic type interactions. And this is, this is in advance of both suspected cases and confirmed cases. What I wish to draw your attention to is this big data occurs well in advance of confirmed and suspected cases and is very useful as a predictor. If we can catch this data, not just in a city, but in a country and globally, we're in a really better position to catch those hotspots that may reemerge in six and nine months time and lock them down individually on a citywide basis and prevent a re-emergence of pandemic version 2.0, which is really what we need to do to bring our economy back on. Now, I'll stop there because otherwise I risk going on and on as I often do. So I'll bring you back. Hopefully you can take the screen there, Horacio, and we'll go into the next part. Thank you, Martin. Really appreciate your perspective as well as Sudi's perspective on how organizations both from government, NGO, and private industry are harnessing the power of data because we always have the concern or more recently have had the concern around how much data is around us and are we saturated with data and gaining insights and then making decisions based on that data. So thank you both for your, your commentary and your perspectives on, on that. I'd like to transition the discussion here to one of a more human perspective. We've had the opportunity to discuss supply chains, traditional plan, source, make, deliver. We've talked a bit about the data that goes into the supply chain modeling, the predictive assessments, and even the prescriptive 
analytics that are yet to come. So from a human perspective, there are many impactful decisions we see global leaders executing, which are concerning to many. Concepts such as test, track and trace, the nationaliz nationalization or nationalizing of supply chains and government control of key economic sectors, including manufacturing and distribution and the potential of centralizing decision-making regarding PPE, medicine, and food are efforts all under consideration. What are your thoughts on protecting civil liberties and individual, indi individual freedoms versus what some may consider the greater good? And I would like to start with Martin and give us a perspective on how and what are the AI opportunities and what are the risks and the costs to civil liberties of doing so, but more significantly, what are the costs and risks of not doing anything at all? Okay, thanks again, Horatio, for setting up the ball for me to kick it into the goal there. Well done. So again, I'd like to share the screen. Okay, so let me start off, bring up another diagram. Now this is just to set the scene of AI opportunity from a short term, others medium term, others longer term. The key component to all of them is data. We need the data to do the big things like AI genomics, to be able to discover new vaccines very rapidly. And that is this number four here. But the first part of number four is to create a data lake of, of data and collect the data. And this is the theme where data privacy really comes in. Are we willing as individuals and as nations to give up data on our very personal natures and uh, diseases? It's a cost to our privacy and civil liberty. As you say, it's a cost. We don't take that opportunity to learn and to be able to produce these new therapeutics, new diagnostics, new uh, ways of helping society rid itself of the plague of mankind, disease that we've suffered from since millennia. But we can track and forecast outbreaks. I discussed that earlier. We can use AI, natural language processing, to be able to filter the data to see what is happening. We can use AI-powered systems to diagnose and to do pre-screening tools. I'll show you another diagram in a moment to do that and, and help to reduce the amount of traffic going into the uh, clinical area so that they can focus on interacting with patients in need as opposed to determining if they have a need. There are, as part of that, there are wearables that we can attach to our smartphones so we can do diagnostics. We can have uh, Bluetooth stethoscopes. We can have uh, fever detectors. We can have blood oxygenation. Those three particular biosignals, biotanks, are particularly important in the diagnosis of corona. As I say, chatbots are important. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but not too much, unfortunately. And drones and robots that could be used as well. Drones which have computer vision to determine if you are six feet apart, or two meters, as people say here in Twitter. And uh, we would be able perhaps to have thermal sensors to detect fever within groups of people. All of these issues have serious ethical concern. There's a cost on both sides of the equation. Let me just show you one example, just one example of how this might work. So here we have an AI engine which has got a diagnostic chatbot and that's integrating with wearable and it's integrating with financial transactions, blockchain secure financial transactions, maybe with Amazon to get your test kits delivered to your home. There are products which are used for managing the, uh, the, the healthcare data of patients. You can communicate with video consultation to clinicians in the event that 
your, your pre-screening suggests that that is needed for you to confirm that, yes, you do need to make a visit. We will send an ambulance to you. As well as getting information from verified sources, from whether it be the World Health or US regional circumstances. So this is an example of an ecosystem. And many of the components in this ecosystem are startups that the AAPM are supporting. So this is just one area. With that, I'll stop uh, the sharing and let other people talk, because I talk too much. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Dr. Stuckelberger, would you like to give some insights into this, this question and, and concepts that Martin has laid out for us? You're on mute, Astrid. You're on mute. Ah. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I will just add, um, I have worked a lot with WHO and on, on this international health regulation, which is precisely for pandemics. And if you don't know is that um, all the states and member states in the world have signed, adopted an international health regulation to be prepared to pandemics of the SARS. Now, nobody's talking about that. and. People have, we have trained people for three years. I was involved with uh, Pretoria University in Georgetown, but we don't see the effects because the training has not kept on. And there is something to say that people have to be much more trained because there is a regulation and a framework. There is a very good booklet that is online in many languages that people can learn from and every institution, business, etc. But now there is a level of legislation national. Then there is the human right perspective. And I know that patients are looking at us and. This is something very dear to Europe, is to protect the privacy, the information, the sensitive information, especially in healthcare, that cannot be shared on Facebook, that cannot be go and, and, and make, the, make the business of people who will then send them information or advertisement that has not been pre-adopted and pre-accepted by the patient. So in Europe, we have a regulation called the General Data Protection Regulation, which is very strict. You can be fined. Many have been fined because of, you know, uh, Facebook, Google, and things like that. So this is a new form of regulating through the people. And it is the patient and the people who have to be at the center of any data <laughs> consent, be it genomic, be it encrypted or not, we now know that we can find data later on, on on genomic with adoption and things like that. So I think this is a very important topic that will have to need a lot of care. People are talking on the web, on the social media about this, and they don't trust anymore the government because this new COVID-19 coronavirus is something unknown. Nobody has seen this before. And this is why even WHO and the governments don't know what they're talking about often because it is information which the patient himself can test as not right. So I think we're going in a new era where precision medicine, and like you said, Martin, uh, the devices that you are developing, and everybody has talked a lot about it, is the solution, because it's people who will accept it through their own means with information that would have to be transparent, information that will be much more adapted to what they have lived and to what the real science of precise medicine. With that, we would have respected the right for health, which is a UN convention, which means we need data and information that is accessible, affordable, adaptable, and of quality. And I hope that precision medicine can deliver that. Thank you, Dr. Stuckelberger. Uh, now, would you like to provide your insights and some, maybe some of your concerns and potential solutions related to some of these topics? Certainly. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. I, I really admired and enjoyed the, the, the points that Dr. Stuckelberger just, um, just raised. In making sense of this crisis and its many facets, Reddit has sometimes been a more accurate and even trustworthy source of actionable information than governmental institutions in many nations. This crisis is showing all of us how important and valuable these new ways of communicating and sharing information are. This is what the internet was really born to, to create. 
we have seen fantastic grassroots bottom-up movements to uh, make and design PPE, to get people informed and engaged. And I think we can do a great deal more. We're seeing many supply chain challenges in PPE, of course, but also increasingly with other resources, including food. For example, um, freshly produced food sometimes ends up literally dumped on the ground um, because it's legally only allowed to be sold for export or for, um, for commercial purposes only. And meanwhile, restaurants are often forbidden from operating as kind of a grocery store. You know, they're sitting on, on massive amounts of catering stocks that they can, can't do anything with, again, because of inflexible regulations. So I think that relaxing some of these regulations temporarily in order to enable these kinds of emergency gray markets would make a big difference. Generally, I would recommend that governments only interfere if they are willing to go all out total war on something. If not, my recommendation in general would be that they step back and allow markets and communities to arrange those necessary matters themselves. And instead, they should use their many resources to shine a spotlight on those citizens of theirs who are really making a difference to help to inspire others to do something similar. Thank you, Nell. Much appreciated. Ritesh, would you like to provide some insights over your, from your career and more recent experience <laughs> with Ogilvy? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, we're all sort of worried about the privacy of healthcare data. Uh, but in our real lives, as we wander around the planet, we're giving our data away all sorts of places. Our mobile phones are emanating it. You know, every social network collects everything we do on location, etc. This is why you get those ads for shoes every time you speak about shoes with your friends all over the place. I think, you know, the media has done a bad job of creating this view that AI and collecting of data is a bad thing when it really isn't. And there are lots of people doing some incredible things today with uh, with this stuff, you know. Um, so there are there are some major ethics issues for sure. But in general, I think the ability to sort, sh show a value exchange to people to say that if we do this and do this with your data, this is the benefit you'll get is the message that we're not putting out there. And if we do that well, and to Astrid's point, and we're collecting all this from a global basis, then I think overall, the general population will be uh, appreciative and will say, fine, I'll get you access to my data because you're doing something good with it. Culturally, there are some countries that are going to do it no matter what you do, but there are others, particularly on the Western side of the world, people are too worried about the privacy, concerning in their personal lives and their day-to-day -day lives, their data is collected, mined, and, and is used for all sorts of things to sell you stuff primarily. So that's, that's the view I have at the moment. Thank you, Ritesh. Very well said. So I think the perspective that uh, in regards to data, data collection and the utilization of data is what uh, Dr. Mathur has mentioned and has made a point in recent discussions is that it's going to require a major global international cooperation and remind everyone that this is a marathon, not a sprint. As we close out this panel, I'd like to have the panelists uh, contemplate and provide their insights on the following, following topic and, and question. We have heard and know about the supply chain shortages due to COVID-19 especially in the healthcare supply chain, as well as issues and concerns with AI, big data, and how they are going to be further adopted. If appointed, what would you do as global or regional national supply chains are, either supply chain or AI, big data are, to avoid the challenges and issues that we're seeing with the current pandemic? Sudi, I'd like to start with you. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, great question. And I'd, I'd of course say I'd want the global role, not a local, because these are global problems. And anytime there's a big challenge or an issue, I, I look at three steps. I do that in my personal life as well. You want to recover quickly, learn what happened, and put the right steps in place so it doesn't happen again. And I look at five dimensions as for any, any type of situation. Is what are the risky capabilities? But you also have to predict who would have thunk two months ago PPE would be a risky component. 
a risky opportunity. Now it's highly at risk. So first we wanna understand what are those, if we have to use AI and big data to predict what are the risks coming out. Then we have to be agile. We worked with the plant in General Motors to get them so that they can get to make ventilators much quickly. You want visibility. I need to know exactly where everything is. You wanna make sure organizations can, can bring their workforce together to make the critical components that are needed to critical APIs, the critical what have you. And then we wanna make sure that are, are these organizations able to function properly in the next disruption, be it a tsunami, be it an earthquake, be it another situation where they have to shut down? Can they actually be deemed a critical business so that their employees can come to work? So I'd look at those five dimensions along those three steps. Thank you, Sudi. Dr. Mathur, your perspective? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to sum it up in just two words. One is uh, at a global scale, we are missing a strategy and we are missing leadership. Uh, I, I think that probably sums everything up. If we uh, are able to have a strategy around this, uh, then rest everything is your, your tactical work and how to uh, come up with these, these smaller steps to ensure that it works and technology already exists and those platforms can be built and deployed. And same thing, you're, we're, we're missing a global leadership at this point of time to, to make sure that there's coordinated action around, around this and uh, deployment of this strategy. So I'm just gonna restrict myself to strategy and leadership. That's what, that's what I would focus on. Thank you. Ritesh? I put SAP in charge. There you are. They control 90% of the healthcare industry anyway, right? So they've got the back end done. Let's get them together and say, right, what are you guys going to do to fix this problem? and then make sure that we collect the data the way we need it. The culture that we need to shift, in my view, as we have a small amount of time, is just-in-time inventory. I think for healthcare and healthcare supplies, we should get away from that culture of just-in-time inventory and look at other ways to maybe stockpiling some specific things in relation to future pandemics. There you are. Thank you. Dr. Stuckelberger, your final thoughts? Well, I would go for... a new paradigm, a new scientific paradigm and methodology that is not there yet, but like someone said, it's a puzzle to put together. Um, the first thing as a scientist, I would review all the data because as it was said, there's data collected in the lab, clinically, at the population level, from the patients, from the population and the policymaker decision impact on people. As we know, it's uncertain, it's a moving target, it is a mutating target, it has never been so uncertain, but it is a great tool for the progress of a new science. It is the basis. Uncertainty and a debate is the hope for having really the right answers at the right moment, at the right time. So I would review all this data. I would also make a very big point on the four key medicine, prevention, prediction, participation, and personalized medicine with precision medicine and boost and enhance something I have not heard enough. It's how to boost and enhance the immunity of people who are not sick or who are sick and who can, with vitamins, with more, this new medicine, um, how can, can we make a new science and a new medicine that helps people sick, not sick, and people to heal and get better, even up, up to 100 years old, like we saw. That's my new hope. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Now, your final thoughts? Well, you know, I don't know if, how many of you saw the video of the Surgeon General of the United States um, teaching people how to make a, a quote unquote mask or face covering out of a t-shirt in an age when we have really sophisticated um, homemade, home fab designs out there. I would love to see government um, helping to curate some of the best solutions that we have out in the world today and empowering their citizens to use them. Thank you now. Frank, your thoughts and perspective? Yes, very shortly as I see the timing. I would, I would uh, enhance BSMA and such organization which are global and which has been designed to foster on collaboration in supply chain to work with governance more. Uh, I see also this crisis as a quality crisis or so we'll use the AI all along the supply chain to increase the quality through traceability and to facilitate processes like customs declaration as I've seen somewhere. And really to, to, to push on these aspects also to facilitate the regulatory aspect as we have seen on some validation of products, maybe to facilitate during pandemics, 
the GDPR, RGPD regulation in order to, to facilitate AI use. Thank you, Frank. And Martin, your final thoughts on this, and thank you once again for being a, a co-moderator in this discussion and over the last few weeks of planning. Thank you, Horatio. I really don't have much time, do I? And all I want to do is to end on as positive a note as I can. We have an audience of people who are worried about coronavirus, and in particular, with the comorbidity of cancer. So I want to send a message of hope to you guys that though we are technologists, we are human. We are not AIs. We are building AIs, and we're building them to augment our capability of serving humanity. So thank you so much for the opportunity, and we wish to be of service. Thank you.